Thank you for the invitation to speak. Are you hearing me well? Okay, good. Robert is hearing me. All right, let me share the screen. Okay, so I will be talking about uh, joint work with Shuchar and Sharkar on a not flirt stable homotopy type. So the main thing we're gonna do, I'll explain how you can associate to a grid diagram, a stable homotopy type whose homology is grid homology. Grid homology is just another name for link flare homology when it's defined from combinatorially from a grid diagram. And I will start to talk with a review of grid homology uh, then the statement of results, and then uh, three and four are explaining the, the constructions, which is based on frame flow categories, um, an old idea due to Cohen, Jones, and Siegel. So I will review what those are, and then I will explain the inductive construction of the frame flow category in this case. Okay, link flow homology, I won't say much about it. I assume many of you uh, know. Uh, well, I've heard of it and its applications. It's a theory that was uh, originally developed for knots by Oshmat Sabo and Rasmussen, knot flow homology, and then it was generalized to links. Uh, then it's called link flow homology, and it has many applications. It detects fiberness, Thurston norm. Um, it tells you about concordance and questions of surgery on knots. And it, it was originally defined with pseudo-holomorphic disks eclectic geometry, but it has a combinatorial description, which sometimes goes under the name of grid homology, uh, which I um, de developed with uh, Peter Oshbat and Shuchoy Sharkar back in 2006. And that's in terms of grid diagrams. And there are different versions of this construction. Um, I'm gonna use the notation in, in the book by um, um, Oshbat, Tipschitz and, and Sabo. Uh, they have a book on this and I will, um, so the version that we will um, discuss in this talk, it's um, GH plus. I will, I will review what that is. Okay, a grid diagram is a representation of knots in, in terms of an end by end grid. And each row and each column contains exactly one X marking and one O marking. And when you trace the vertical and horizontal segments, with the verticals on top, you see the link. So this is a grid diagram for the trefoil. And whether it's an O or an X just specifies the orientation of the link. In a grid diagram, uh, we, well, we're gonna define a chain complex and um, the, um, yeah, so the generators are the states which are N tuples of points on the grid, one on each vertical and horizontal circle. Um, and they correspond to permutations of n elements. And here's another generator in blue, another n tuple. Oh, by the way, we're on the torus, so we're identifying the opposite sides. And then we have rectangles, uh, which correspond to uh, pseudo-holomorphic strips in the symmetric product of the grid. This is really some version of Lagrangian flow homology. Uh, but combinatorially, we just count these rectangles. Um, so when the red and the blue differ exactly in two rows and two columns, there's a rectangle. And if it doesn't have any other dots inside, well, we, we're gonna keep track of it. And we're defining the grid complex. So again, this is an old story back from 2006. The version that I'm using here is a little non-standard, but it's similar to what's done in link flare homology. So uh, X, uh, the X's are the generators, uh, but, oh, yes, this works. Um, yes, but I'm gonna upgrade it with powers of some formal variables U, and then um, I'm gonna define the differential to count these rectangles. So for each rectangle, um, I'm gonna, the differential of X is going to have the Y's and it's going to have this power of U corresponding to um, if I go through the marking OI, I put a UI. And I'm not allowing um, 
the domains to go through the X's. In principle, you could do that, but in the variant GC plus, we don't allow them to go over the X's and we keep track of going over O's with these variables UI. And you can show that the homology, this is grid homology and it's independent of the grid. It's a link invariant. Uh, so one important aspect of grid homology that we're gonna encounter in this talk and um, it's bubbling. So this, this is a general feature in Lagrangian flow homology. So Lagrangian flow homology is about the symplectic manifold and you have Lagrangians. In our case, it's the symmetric product of the grid. And then you have tori corresponding to products of the horizontal lines and products of the vertical lines. And you, the, um, yeah, so the rectangles are really pseudo holomorphic strips um, and they come in moduli spaces. And then you want to count them as before and get del squared equal zero and for that, we usually want this relation that the boundary of MXY, the compactification corresponds to trajectory breaking, to splitting a trajectory into two trajectories, one from X to Z and one from Z to Y. But this is not always true in symplectic geometry. Some, sometimes you have uh, this phenomenon of disk and sphere bubbles. And in general, we don't even have del squared equal zero. But here for the grid homology, we do have del squared equal zero. And that's because, well, one thing is that we don't have sphere bubbles. Um, and, oh, actually I should mention, we don't even have disk bubbles. Yeah, we don't have any bubbles. Sorry, this is a mistake, but in more general versions of grid homology, and this is actually gonna be important even for GH plus, is that uh, we do have these bubbles which correspond to the rows and columns on the grid. So somehow this is a row and it cancels out with the column. Uh, like when you, when you write the formula for del squared. Now, of course, if, we, if we're not allowing to go over an X marking, then there's no full row or full column in GH plus. But if you care, if, if you would allow things to go over X or O, then you would need to, to talk about this grid cancellation and somehow we'll need to talk about that even for GH plus to construct the spectrum. Okay. Um, yes, okay. Well, are there any questions so far about this review? So what we want is to upgrade this invariant, which is a homology group to a space or more precisely to a suspension spectrum. So this is an element in the stable homotopy category. Um, the simplest version of it, which is just formal desuspensions of spaces, which are, we can just be CW complexes. So um, in general, stable homotopy groups are the co-limit of taking the suspension of two spaces and looking at homotopy classes of maps between let's say sigma qx and sigma qy, but I'm also allowing formal desuspension and I'm putting minus n and minus m. So the objects are just this xn, so which allow me to talk about like the minus five dimensional sphere, like S0 comma five. So this is my category. It's just a small generalization of a topological space sort of a CW complex. And by homology, I just mean the homology of X shifted with this N. There are generalizations of this category that algebraic topologists like to talk about like spectra and prospectra, but uh, for GH plus, we just, I mean, our objects, the object we will construct is just a pair of this type. Okay, so what, uh, we want, uh, what I want to explain is how to associate to each grid diagram and integer j, uh, this suspension spectrum xj plus um, of, um, of g, such that the homology is the grid homology, the plus version. Maybe I, I should say, so grid homology comes with two gradings. There's the homological grading and the uh, Alexander grading, which gives the Alexander polynomial. And for each Alexander grading, we have a spectrum. And the homology in the usual homological grading gives GHIJ. And GH plus also has this additional structure of a module over the polynomial ring with the UI variables, which 
keep track of how you go over the um, uh, OI. Um, and this corresponds in, in this setting for spaces to just a map between the spaces for uh, J and J minus one. So in general, the U map changes Alexander grading by minus one and homological grading by minus two. And this corresponds to this suspension. Okay, so the construction is based on framed flow categories, uh, the work of the idea of Cohen, Johnson, Siegel. And it's very much inspired by what was done for Hovanov homology. So the stable homo, uh, Hovanov stable homotopy types, which were constructed by Lipschitz and Sharkar in 2011. Okay, let me just give an example of what these spaces are supposed to look like. So this is the torus knot T25, and this is its uh, blink flow homology. Um, the plus version, the, the Alexander grading is on the vertical axis. And in each, um, so in each grading, we have, uh, we have some generators and we have some differentials. For example, in this grading, these two generators cancel with each other when we have the differential. And we're just left with the homology in degree six. Six is the homological degree. And here we just have the homology in degree four. Here we have, um, well, we have two of them. We have uh, this and this, uh, and then we have, uh, and then here we have one, here we have none, and here we have one. So in general, if it's, um, oh, here we have two. But if it's in two consecutive gradings, then it turns out that, or, or just in one gradings, then there's no option for the spectrum. The spectrum has to be a wedge of sphere, of spheres. So the only ambiguity, like if you want to get some new information is what happens here, where you have two generators in different gradings. In this case, they differ by, I mean, by more than one, by three in this case. So you can think of this as a space made out of two cells in dimensions minus one and two, and they're attached by a map. And the map would go from S1 to S minus one. And there are two possibilities because pi two of zero is zima two. So stable maps from S1 to S minus one are stima two. Um, and well, I should say we did not compute this. We're hoping to write a computer program soon, but just um, the expectation is that in this case, uh, this is zero. Just based on what happens in holomorphic geometry, we're kind of guessing that this is zero and therefore it's a wedge of sphere in that degree as well. Okay, uh, so I should say this, this is just the beginning of something, hopefully we didn't, uh, I mean, it took us a long time to just do the construction from a grid and there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, I mean, one thing we can do, uh, we, we can do some other versions uh, apart from GH plus. The only thing uh, uh, is that we need to avoid the particular X marking on the grid. So we're not allowed to have like, there's versions of link flow homology where you can go over all the markings. And I want to avoid just one marking. I mean, in the GH plus version, I avoid all the X markings, but any version that just um, avoids at least one marking, then it's fine. We can do that. Of course, I mean, we would like to construct it in general, but more importantly, we didn't yet prove that it's a not invariant. We expect it to be a not invariant and Hopefully it will be done at some point, but so far in the paper on the archive is just a construction from a grid. And ideally there, I mean, there should be similar constructions in Hegart floor for three manifolds, uh, which are used, uh, which would be using um, pseudo holomorphic curves. And I mean, it would be good if the whole theory was developed and then this would be just a computational aspect of it, which you can, plug into the grid and uh, I mean, plug, a, plug have a grid and just plug it into the computer and get some computations. And yeah, we try to look for examples where the grid uh, homologies are the same and the spectra are not the same, but it appears that at least for knots up to 10 crossings, there should not be such examples. Uh, more likely there could be non-trivial maps. So there are maps even between spheres like the Hopf map that's trivial in homology, but not in homotopy. 
And okay, we're still exploring. Maybe this will be seen at some point. But so far, we just have a construction. Sorry. Okay, so now I will tell you about the construction, unless there are any questions. Okay, so the construction is based on first building a frame flow categories. And this is um, the general idea of how to upgrade a chain complex to a suspension spectrum. This was introduced by Cohen, Jones, and Siegel. So what you want to do is you have a chain complex, you're gonna make a category whose objects are the generators of the complex. And the morphisms, uh, well, are a set, but they also have some topology. They're supposed to be a compact manifold with corners. Uh, in fact, it has some more structure, is what's called the N manifold or a D manifold of the dimension given by the uh, difference of the gradings minus one. In Lagrangian fermology in symplectic geometry, this is meant to be the compactified modulized space of holomorphic strips from X to Y. So you want to construct such a space satisfying this property that the boundary of M bar XY is the disjoint union over all ways of breaking the trajectories from X to Z and C to Y. Mm. And then you have more stuff. You, have, you also need to embed these spaces in some way neatly into some suitable, uh, well, Euclidean spaces with corners. They're manifolds with corners and they, this embedding has to preserve the corner structure. And you need to frame the normal bundles of these manifolds inside the Euclidean space. And you need compatibility of the embeddings under this relation and compatibility of the framings under this relation. Okay, so that's a frame flow category. And once you have such a thing, you get a spectrum. Um, so the way you do it is you, I mean, it's explained by Cohen, Johnson, Siegel, but the idea is you have, you make a spectrum by having a uh, cell for each generator, a d-dimensional cell for each generator in degree d. And then you attach the cells in a way that's being um, given to you by these moduli spaces, m bar x, y, using the pontryagin tom construction. So here is the simplest example. If you have just two generators for your chain complex, uh, then you want to, uh, you have an A cell and a B cell, and you want to attach the B cell to the A cell, and you need to specify this map from SB minus one to SA. In other words, this is an element in the stable homotopy groups of spheres, which by the Pontryagin term construction is the same as uh, framed cobordism um, equivalence classes. So it's a manifold of dimension K up to framed cobordism. And this is exactly this, this M bar X, Y. So the, many, the spaces in the frame flow category give you the attaching maps. This was a simple example. It didn't have any boundary. It's just like a manifold. In general, you have many generators and you have all these boundary relations, but Cohen, John Siegel tell you how to put them all together and get one spectrum. So, yeah, so all I have to do is to construct a frame flow category. I, I have to construct these moduli spaces M bar X, Y. And if they satisfy these properties and they have all of these framings and embeddings, then I, I will get the spectrum. Okay, so let's see how, um, how to construct it. All right, uh, so we have our um, grid complex GC plus, and we want to construct manifolds with corners between the generators. The generators are, are not just these end tuples on the grid, but they also have powers of U. And um, I mean, it just depends on the difference of these powers. So what we're gonna do is basically when we have a positive domain from X to Y, so positive domain is just the sum of rectangles. So maybe like this or like this, maybe they can even have multiplicity. 
uh, and this, um, yes, um, if you have a, a positive domain from X to Y, uh, in our case, we just um, go over the O base points and we wanna keep track of how many times it goes that many, it, it should go that many times. Um, then that's when we want to have a manifold because that's the only um, a manifold with corners. That's, I mean, that's what symplectic geometry tells us that we need to have this positive domain. Now, two domains are equivalent if they differ by a periodic domain, which is a linear combination of the difference of a row and column through the same O. So this has to do with this bubble cancellation in the sense that, um, so for the simplest example is just a row and a column going through the same O. These are domains going from um, X to UX. And there are two different domains. And we say that they're equivalent. And since we're just keeping track of the, pow of the, of the powers of U, uh, we basically want to associate, I mean, you can think of this data as X and Y and the powers of U as an equivalence class of positive domains where two domains differ by replacing a row with a column. That's when they are equivalent. Okay, so we're gonna write M bar of the equivalence class of domains. Okay, and this is a model for the moduli space of pseudo-holomorphic strips in the symmetric product supported in domains in this class. So this is some, we're trying to model something from symplectic geometry. Okay, so let's just review what we need. If we have two generators, there are some domains, there are some positive domains that connect them. Um, I don't know, we'll, we'll see some pictures in a moment, but for example, a domain could look like this. And we want to construct this manifold with corners and bar of D of the equivalence class of D such that uh, its boundary uh, in fact, there are different types of boundary. Um, this is what it means, a D-manifold, the boundary is split into different parts. But basically the boundary should consist of products of simpler domains where the sum of the domains is D. So for example, this, um, this domain is the sum of these two, uh, two rectangles. So we want the boundary to, con to contain the product of the moduli spaces associated to them. And we want embeddings of these moduli spaces into Euclidean spaces with corners and framings of their normal bundles. Okay, so what we will do is we're gonna construct, um, we're gonna construct uh, moduli spaces for each domain in the equivalence class. And M bar of D is gonna be their union. But the interesting thing is that these ones are not gonna be manifolds with corners. They're gonna be quite interesting. They're gonna be Whitney stratified spaces with a, basically with singularities, with some complicated singularities, but I will, just, yeah, I will tell you what the singularities are supposed to be. And um, the, yeah, so their stratification comes from the structure of disk bubbles. All this, all, all this, uh, I mean, yes, so in general, as I said, there are bubbles and therefore we don't expect M bar of D to just have um, the boundary to be just products of smaller domains. It, all, it will also have some bubbles and that will give this weird, I mean, stratified space structure. But the interesting thing is that we will, uh, once they are glued together, you just get the manifold with corners. So M bar of D. It's, it's a fine manifold with corners and it has the right structure. So for that, we need to glue them and we need to keep track of, of, of their boundary, of their boundary strata, which correspond to bubbles. And what this means is that we have to also construct moduli spaces of domains along, uh, along with a collection of disk bubbles attached to them. So for every domain, I not only have to construct a moduli space associated to this, but some also some moduli spaces associated to the domain and some bubbles. Okay, so these are gonna be called M bar and lambda D, where this, these uh, subscripts uh, are gonna encode like how many bubbles we have.
Okay, let's see some examples, just what we expect these moduli spaces to be. So if we have just, uh, first of all, if we have just a rectangle, then that's, that's gonna just give us a point. That's um, because we wanted to contribute to the differential. If we have two rectangles, a domain aid of two rectangles, then uh, we have the boundary is supposed to be trajectories. It's supposed to be ways of breaking it in two. And there are two such ways. You can first do the first rectangle, like move from this generator to this, and then the second, or first you do the top rectangle and then the first. So you're gonna have something where the boundary is two points. And the natural guess is that it's an interval. In principle, it might also have some space, some circles, but it's a one manifold with this boundary. And if you have a, an L shape, then there are also two ways of splitting it into rectangles. So we also expect something like an interval. So this is the moduli space associated to this domain. So far, there are very nice manifolds with boundary. If you have three, um, three rectangles, then you get a manifold with corners. In, in fact, in this case, you get a hexagon. There are like six, way, six permutations according to which, doma which domain you do first. And these are the vertices of the hexagon. And um, yeah, and then you have edges corresponding to um, disks going over B, C, and then A to the previous moduli spaces, the one that were associated to two rectangles times the one associated to a single rectangle, which is a point. And all together you get an edge and you have six edges. And there are two kinds of edges, like thick and thin. This just corresponds to the two different kinds of boundary. Like if you, if you have a breaking into something made out of two rectangles times something made out of one rectangle, then I draw a thick line. If you first break into one rectangle times something made out of two, I don't know, it's a different type of uh, edge. So that's manifold with corners. Oh yes, and now sometimes we have bubbles. So this is the first example where two things are equivalent. So the row AB is equivalent to the column CD. And so for the row, we have one, one boundary, which is just the usual trajectory breaking, a splitting into two rectangles, A and B. But then we have another boundary, which is this bubble. So this is a new kind of boundary, which is still a point in this case. Uh, I'm drawing it in blue. And similarly for the column. So I only care about M of this equivalence class. So I have to glue them together and I glue them together at the bubble and I get one whole interval. So that, that's kind of the analog of bubble cancellation. Like one bubble kind of gets glued to the other bubble, uh, the moduli spaces, and you get this interval. Okay, similarly, this is the same uh, example as before. So if I have A, B, if I have a row, and then I have an extra rectangle. So A plus B plus C, this is my new domain. And I get, this pentagon, it has a whole uh, interval of bubbles and you can glue it to this a column plus C and you get another hexagon. Okay, here's an even more complicated example where you have two rows, which are equivalent to two columns or are equivalent to, um, uh, sorry, to a row plus a column. And you have basically four uh, domains in this equivalence class. And you can check that the structure should be four polyhedra glued together. And this is one polyhedron. So it's part one of four, but all of them look together. And this is the interval of bubbles on the boundary. So, so far, these are still manifolds with corners. Uh, no problem. Here is the first example that's not a manifold with corners that has some more complicated singularity. So we have, um, so this corresponds to two rows, but they're the same row. So AB plus AB. So the domain is twice this row. And what happens in this example? So it turns out the moduli space is expected to look like a pyramid, uh, but where 
this phase, um, I don't know, you think of it as being just the smooth quadrilaterals. And then I'm taking, I'm taking this point, this green point, and I'm pulling it out, like let's say towards me from the blackboard, well, screen, whatever we have now. Uh, and it becomes uh, like a manifold with corners here with three corners. But here you have a non-trivial singularity. It's not uh, a manifold with corners. This is like in the middle of the, of the face. And this corresponds to having a double bubble, like, uh, like this row coming as a bubble twice at the same um, height. Okay, so this particular shape uh, is for the domain two AB, so two times the row. And this is equivalent to uh, replacing a row times a column, right? So you could also do row plus column, and it's also equivalent to two columns. So there are three parts of this. This is one part. And there's another part just, just like this corresponding to twice the column. And if you do one row plus one column, you get this thing, which is, well, it's kind of interesting. This is the singularity. And basically you think of this as this face and this face pulled in and glued along this, um, this green line. Okay. so. The way this looks has a name, it's the Whitney umbrella. So this is the simplest model of a non-trivial singularity that appears for this modulized space, spaces. It's a famous example in singularities. It's given by A squared B equals C squared. And here there are basically three regions of the plane, one region, another region, and another region kind of coming from both sides. And there are three regions coming together and just overall just giving a manifold. And this is what we expect to happen for the moduli spaces. And that's what was happening there. You had like three moduli spaces all equivalent. And when you glue them together, you're just gonna get the manifold with corners, with the corners are somewhere else. So in general, um, yeah, the, the modulized spaces with bubbles um, are gonna have singularities on, on just one model. I mean, for each N, uh, we have this space, the symmetric product of the, of the complex plane divided by translation, which is just R2 N minus one. So it's a Euclidean space, but it has a decomposition according to how many of the imaginary parts of these ZIs are negative or positive or zero. And um, this is a generalization of the Whitney umbrella, which is N equals two. So it's some decomposition into singular spaces, but altogether they form a Euclidean space. And these are the local models for our stratified spaces. So we have to construct spaces with these local models. Okay, so how are we gonna construct them? The construction is, I mean, you, I mean, you can try to construct them for like in the pictures I drew for small domains, but in general you have, it's gonna be not very explicit. It's gonna be inductive. And this is actually similar to how it was done in Fovano homology by Lipschitz and Sharkar. Uh, you do some induction on the dimension. So we want to construct moduli spaces associated to a domain B and also some number of bubbles. And we keep track of them by uh, these numbers Ni, vectors of numbers, which count Nj counts the number of bubbles through one of the markings, like o, the O marking, the Jth O marking. And the bubbles come grouped according to a partition. You have to keep track of their height. So in symplectic geometry, you have holomorphic strips, and then you have disc bubbles, and they come at different heights, but some of them might come at the same height. And that gives you a partition of this number N1 and another partition of N2. So you keep track of all this data, and for every vectors N and lambda and domain D, we want to construct a moduli space, and we know what the, mod, what the local model should be. It should be some generalization of the Whitney umbrella. We can we can specify exactly what the local model is, but we want to construct this global space embedded in some Euclidean space and with framings. 
and this will give us the framed flow category. Okay, so we will construct these inductively on their dimension. And the first step, this is the base case. We're gonna construct it when we have the trivial domain from some fixed generator. So the domain that's just zero. And we allow bubbles. We allow just one bubble at each height. Basically the entries of N are just zero and one. And depending on how many bubbles you have, this is supposed to have dimension N for N bubbles. And we define it to be the permutahedron. This is a particular polytope. And we have to construct a normal framing for an embedding of the permutahedron into Euclidean space. Um, I mean, we expect the permutahedron because we kind of know how the boundary is supposed to be. The boundary is supposed to correspond to um, um, to splittings of bubbles. And you start with an interval and then you think about what you get. You get these hexagons that you've seen before. And at the next step, you kind of expect the permutahedron. So we just define it to be the permutahedron. The permutahedron, by the way, it's the, it's the convex linear uh, combination, uh, convex hull of, um, of the um, sigma one, sigma n inside Rn over all permutations. That's a definition. Okay, but this is our base case. We do this by hand. And then we define the moduli spaces inductively on their dimension. So for example, in dimension zero, we define them to be points. And then we go, okay, and then we want to do the inductive step, which is the main thing. So let's suppose we constructed all the moduli spaces up to dimension K along with embeddings and normal framings. And with their, uh, with their given um, local models. So the local models are based on this generalization of the Whitney umbrella. Okay, so we're gonna, so to construct a new space, we're gonna start with the boundary um, and we're gonna, um, and we just wanna fill in the boundary. So the boundary is already there. I mean, it's made out of products of the lower dimensional moduli spaces and we wanna fill it. So for that, first of all, the boundary is kind of a manifold with corners. So we're gonna smooth it and get something, I don't know, boundary ply prime, which is a K dimensional frame manifold. So in other words, it's an element in the frame cobordism group. So we have this manifold and the framing and we want to fill it in. So ideally we want this to be zero in this frame, in this group. If it's zero, then we can fill it in. Okay, but in principle it's non-zero because we don't know. So we're gonna try to change it and, um, and yes, and make it zero. Okay, and for that we have to, okay, we have to first define a complex. So this is a new complex coming from the grid. It's not the grid floor complex. It's a complex of positive domains with partitions. So the generators are the triples D and Lambda. So the, recall that these were the things. So D is a positive domain and N and Lambda describe the bubbles. So for every such triple, we're supposed to define a moduli space. Well, we're first gonna make a chain complex out of this data and the differential corresponds to what we're supposed to see on the boundaries of the moduli space. Um, so, well, there are four types of terms. Maybe I won't get into all the details, but the main term is that if I have a, a, a domain like this, I'm allowed to subtract a rectangle. So I'm gonna have this plus some other terms. And then there are some, the other terms are gonna to correspond to, um, to like getting rid of a bubble um, in various ways. So, or like two bubbles reaching the same height. It corresponds to doing something to this, to this vectors N or the vector of partition. But you can make a complex out of this. It's defined combinatorially. You will see in a moment why we care about this. Um, so yeah, so another term is dropping the first or the final term in the partitions and so on. You can show that del squared equals zero. 
and you can compute the homology. So this is some, um, some part of the paper where we computed the homology and we, we, we got that it's, um, well, the rank in degree K is N choose K and overall the rank is two to the N for the grid diagram of size N. But we, we can find an acyclic sub uh, quotient complex with trivial homology if we, um, if we uh, quotient out the sub complex where this homology is actually um, supported. And these are the triples that I mentioned before where the domain is trivial and n, the vector n of bubbles is made of zeros and ones. So you have one at most one bubble at each height. So there are two to the n generators like this. Uh, and, and, if I, and if I divide out by this, then the rest has just acyclic, it's, it's, it has trivial homology. So this is a theorem you have to compute. You have to show that this has trivial homology. Okay, so now comes the inductive step. Okay, so let's recall we had we had the boundaries of we're trying to do an inductive construction of the moduli space, and we know the boundary. And the boundary was was an element in framed cobordism, so it might not bound a frame manifold. But whatever it is, we can keep track of the data d and lambda, and we can think of this obstruction as something in harm from CDP prime to omega k framed. So for every domain with n and lambda, we associate this, this class, the moduli space that we have. And if this obstruction were zero, then we would be able to construct the next spaces. We would be able to get the inductive step. Okay, the obstruction is not zero, but one can show that it's a co-cycle that del of omega k of ok is zero. And the important thing is that now we're using that the, our calculation that the CDP prime was acyclic. And since it's acyclic, also the harm complex from it to anything else is also acyclic. And therefore it's the co-boundary of some element B. So what we do now is we use this element B uh, to adjust the definition of the K-dimensional moduli spaces. So these were the ones that were already constructed. Uh, we will like whatever they were, we redefine them to uh, add by basically adding something for minus B. Um, like just take framed manifolds representing minus B and rechange the definition of these moduli spaces of dimension K, not of dimension K minus one. So at each inductive step, you are allowed to change what was done at the previous step. Uh, why not? And then if you do that, then you basically changed, um, like you replace OK by Delta B and you made it to be zero. So OK was Delta B. So we use the fact that this is acyclic to, um, to arrange uh, for these moduli spaces to have, um, so once you redefine them, the ones at the previous step, this class is gonna be zero. That's what this obstruction theory tells you is that you can arrange that this is zero, even if it's not zero originally. Okay, and now we are ready to finish the inductive step. So, um, yeah, so we have this um, moduli space um, that's previously constructed and we arrange for it to bound something and we're just gonna fill it in with whatever. It doesn't matter with what. In fact, whatever we're filling it in with, we may change it at the next step, but it won't matter. It just matters that you can do it. So you do this and then you continue with the induction. So at every, so at each step, you define the moduli space of the next dimension by, by starting from points and then doing this inductive step. And yes, and this way you get the frame flow category. Um, I mean, you construct these things and then you first of all, glue them together since you know what the, what the, 
singularities are on the boundary, you are allowed to glue them together and you get actual manifolds with corners that you can put in the flame flow category. And yes, and that's how we get the spectrum. Um, you can show that it's independent of how you feel. Yes, but um, yes, but in principle, it depends on the grid. I mean, we, we claim that, I mean, we hope to prove that maybe it won't depend on the grid and it's a link invariant. Um, let me just end with an observation that the important thing in this whole story was that we managed to have the obstruction go through some complex that was acyclic, that it has zero homology. And that's just a calculation on the grid. And this, um, this was why we had to do a bunch of things in the, uh, I mean, when I was talking about um, our range of applicability, we had to avoid one X marking uh, on the grid. So we, we don't want to go to allow to look at versions of grid homology where we go over all the markings because one, you, once you go over this marking, then the homology is no longer be acyclic and we don't know what to do. And that's why we also had to first construct these moduli spaces for uh, when D is trivial, uh, because CDP was not acyclic. Only when you quotient by them was, was acyclic. So for these ones, which kind of, um, we make them to be the starting point and we had to construct the moduli spaces by hand and we define them to be permutahedra. And also this is why we had to consider bubble configurations. So that's an important point. I mean, in principle, I said that we're just looking with GH plus and GH plus we're not allowed to go over excess. So we're not allowed to have a full row and we're not allowed to have a full column. But if we just look at domains that don't go over the excess, then the excess can be anywhere on the grid and the homology is very complicated and we are not able to compute it. In fact, it's usually not acyclic. We computed it on the computer in some cases. So we somehow, we only are able to do this argument when we consider all the domains away from some X, all the domains on the grid, then we can compute that this is acyclic. And that's why we have to talk about bubbles and we have to do this stratification and all that. But once you do the induction with all the domains on the grid, except for one X, then you have an acyclic complex and you could prove that you can construct these spaces inductively. Um, yeah, all right, and that's the construction. So I'll stop here. Are there any questions? I have one question. Uh, you talk about uh, invariance. So could you can uh, prove some of the grid moves or you try? Uh, yes, yes, we can. I mean, cyclic permutation is obvious and we can prove commutate, uh, we can prove commutation. Yes, the problem is stabilization. Stabilization uses some complicated domains and we would have to show that the, that there's an acyclic complex made of these complicated domains. And I don't know, we just, it got too complicated, but maybe we'll pick it up soon. Another question is, uh, is there any orientation question in this construction which controls the signs and the... Uh... Yes, 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 absolutely. So um, the moduli spaces come with framings. Oh, framings. And when you have you points, have points, it just corresponds to correspond to having plus or minuses on the points, like if you have positive or negative orientations, and these are exactly the signs. So actually when I said that the first base, the base case is just for zero dimensional moduli spaces, I define them to be points. I also have to specify their sign and the sign is the usual sign from grid homology. Do we have another question? Uh, maybe I, I have one. So uh, you said that in your construction of this uh, CDP complex, you need to fix one base point. So I, I, was, I was wondering, is there an analog for that in a flat layer homology? So it looks to me like maybe it could be connected to, the, uh, I think it's called unreduced flat layer where, where one adds an extra pair of alpha beta curves with an extra base point. Uh, uh, could there be any connection to that? Oh, um, well, 
so an extra alpha beta with um, so mm, no I mean uh, it's um, this is just the usual plus version of Nutler homology where you just don't allow things to go over um, over one type of markings uh, but um, yeah, no, I, th I think that's different. That, that, that would correspond to just having a whole extra component. But here it's just about the number of face points on the link itself. Look at uh, another question. Uh, yeah. Actually, oh, can I ask one question? Sure. Uh, yes, Marco. So um, this construction, uh, seems to decompose pretty well uh, on the Alexander gradings, as you pointed out, because when you have a domain, uh, it relates only things within the same Alexander grading. So you get a spectrum uh, that somehow is a disjoint union of things, uh, I suppose, uh, one for each Alex Alexander grading. But yes. uh, in grid homology, you have uh, U maps uh, that relate uh, different uh, Alexander gradings. Uh, so do you get any maps like that? Uh, yes, for the yes, spectrum. Yeah. yeah. And so. is there a choice there? Because uh, I guess th they should correspond to some map in the stable pi zero, uh, in the stable pi two of S zero, maybe. Um, yeah, so, so there are these maps here. And um, Okay, uh, I mean, yes, there could be, but there's not in these simple examples that we looked at. So, uh, I mean, in like in this case, they, they just go like this, right? And these are, I mean, there's just one sphere in that thing. Oh, let's see. So here you would have, so somehow in this case, they're, they're just determined by what they are on homology. But in principle, there could be. Okay, I see. And maybe follow up question. Sometimes, uh, I mean, you taught me that uh, the plus version of, uh, uh, say, fluoromology can be interpreted as an S1 equivariant uh, homology somehow. Mm. Um, would you expect uh, to be able to see an S1, a, a, some spectrum uh, with an S1 action? Um, okay, so uh, this is a good question. So this U is not supposed to come from an S1 action. Um, the one in Hegard Fleur is supposed to come. Basically, you see the S1 action when you see the sphere bubbles. I think I think it's related to going to over all the base points. Uh, this one is kind of, I mean, the fact that uh, th this one is just a map. And in fact, it's kind of silly that we have these two. I think this is just a convention. Like you could have, if you don't, if you just uh, stay away from, from the X markings, then you could have defined this to be anything you want. Like, um, like the fact that we put this minus two shift in not homology is just a convention. I mean, it comes from the fact that, uh, that if you go over the other base point, that's what happens. But this U is just like, you, uh, I mean, it, it's not related to the S1 action. Yeah, but um, what should I say? So uh, maybe the point is that you can see the difference, um, like for the R naught, in this case, you will just get things like S0 wedge, S2 wedge, S4 wedge, blah, blah, blah. You won't see CP infinity. You will only see things like this when you go over the other base point, if you could do that. So Thanks. this is kind of, orthogonal to what you were talking about, but is there, is there any possibility of a construction, say, for HFL hat um, in cyber Witten theory, similar to your spectra constructions there, where you think about, say, the kronheimer Mrovka definition of sutured floor homology, or is that sort of obviously doesn't exist for... Oh. Uh, that's a good question. Hmm. Um, uh, 
Maybe there is, yes. So, I mean, the, the thing is that they define sutures plural homology by looking at manifolds with B1 greater than zero. And furthermore, their manifolds where the triple cup product is non-trivial, which in principle tells you that the polarization class is non-trivial. So somehow you don't really expect the spectrum like a finite dimensional approximation. So, I mean, recently Sasahira and Staffragan defined the spectrum for B1 greater than zero, but assuming the triple cup product is zero, mm -hmm. but it's not for S1 times Sigma. So it's not quite clear if you can do the same thing, but um, I mean, I don't know, maybe. Uh, Maybe okay, one. There, all right. So there but is that's really the main obstruction. The, yeah. The point is that that obstruction really causes a problem. Okay. Yeah. Yes. It shouldn't cause a problem if, for example, you just want to comp uh, define K theory. Um, yeah. Anyway. And I guess maybe my other question was sort of related to Marco's, but maybe, I mean, on. Not floor homology, just like, you know, I mean, there's somehow a differential to some invariant for S3 in the same way that on um, Kovanov homology, there's the Lie differential or something similar. And is it the same situation here that there's no way to kind of reassemble these individual pieces and individual gratings to get something that's reflects that well uh i mean um you i mean uh, okay so here there are two differentials right there's uh, you know going over w and over c's so so what we did kind of takes care of one of them i mean you just have uh, these u maps um and um i mean that's what they are i don't know what 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 should be the analog of a spectral sequence on on spectra, but I mean, I mean, it's just like the equivariant theory. Yeah, so you just make it an equivariant theory with this U action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, um, yeah, so somehow if, if, yeah, and then you have the other, uh, the other thing, uh, the, the other going over the other base point, and then, uh, then I would expect uh, something over CP infinity, some space that lives over CP infinity. Um, yeah, but yeah, no, I actually expect the difference. I mean, you, you yeah. should be able to see the whole thing. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions? Let's uh, find the speaker again. Thank you. <laughs>